Thank you. Well, the next speaker, uh, Robert Weiss, and we'll talk about uh, the influence of landslides on tsunamis. All right, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, submarine landslides and their tsunamis. And so it's not uh, earthquake related necessarily. I would like to start with this uh, Einstein quote that says, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And that's what I'm trying to do with the uh, landslide modeling, or that might be also the uh, state of the art at the moment uh, in uh, landslide modeling. But before we go into landslide, I would like to spend some time on uh, how we do ha tsunami hazard assessment uh, currently. So we, uh, we do carefully evaluate possibly a possible source in a given area, for example, earthquakes, landslides, volcanic eruptions, and meteorite impacts. Uh, most certainly, the first one, the earthquake, is the best understood uh, of how we generate tsunamis, uh, much less we know about submarine and subaerial landslides. Volcanic eruption is probably the least known, and we know something about the meteorite impacts, but they are often so, so rare that we exclude them from our analysis. Then we have to appropriate, appropriately describe the water dynamics, and we uh, uh, use equations like the shallow, shallow water equations, which are most commonly used. Or we use a Boisnet type equation, for example, the, what, uh, what Stefan uh, presented. Or in a three-dimensional framework, we can use Navier-Stokes or the Euler equations. And these three types of equations are usually uh, or commonly used in, in tsunami models. But beyond the uh, dynamical uh, description of the, uh, of the waves and their, and their sources, we also have to constrain the model somehow. And we can constrain the source uh, with measurements. In, in, terms, uh, in case of earthquakes, we have the seismometers and, and respective inversions from that. We can look at uh, historic accounts. And we can also go to the geologic uh, ev uh, evidence, such as uh, uh, tsunami deposits or uh, earthquake-related subsidence, uh, these drowned uh, forests and the, at the Oregon coast, for example. Then we also have to, co have to constrain the, uh, the flooding, the, uh, the tsunami itself. And we do it again by measurements, by historic accounts, or eyewitness accounts, if it's, a, if it's a more recent event. Or we look at tsunami deposits. And then for a very uh, comprehensive tsunami hazard assessment, we would like to bring that into a, into a, pro, a probabilistic framework to actually make predictions in the f uh, for the future. And what we do is, this is the, uh, this is the Pacific, obviously. In the, red bar, uh, uh, the red columns here are the, uh, are the earthquake uh, zones, subduction zones. They produce earthquake, uh, subduction earthquakes. And in the framework that how I'm used to uh, uh, this kind of uh, procedure, this is all pre-computed in a database. And then in this case, we, do, we go to Hawaii. We have a first grid, uh, very large with the Hawaiian island. Then on an island scale model, sort of telescope down, and then the harbor that we look at. And, and what we then can do is, uh, obviously, this is the, uh, this is the wave, uh, wave height maximum. Uh, in Hilo, it had gauge in Hilo, and these these colors represent the wave height at this tide gauge from these particular sources. So we see that for an uh, for an 
Uh, for a 7.5 earthquake, obviously we have everything is blue because it's very low. And then if you go to the very large one, the 9.3 uh, here in D, we have obviously very large uh, um, tight gauge signals. However, it's not, it's not uh, globally increasing. What you see is that certain hotspots or certain earthquakes are more sensitive to the tight gauge uh, measurement than others. For example, here in Alaska, it's always, always, a, always a big problem. Uh, uh, tight gauge measurement seems to be very large in that area compared to, let's say, here or the uh, or the Middle American uh, zone. Or we can also do with earthquakes. It's very uh, it's very impressive how the uh, forecast works, and this is from the Peruvian tsunami or earthquake and tsunami in 2007. So this is an, uh, uh, what we call the fingers of death. So going off and uh, and uh, uh, as a result of the earthquake. And in a timeline, if you will, you have here the uh, sort of the warning centers messages. Uh, that is the uh, NOAA Center for Tsunami Re Research Group's uh, sort of answer. And this is the group that I, I, I was in before I joined universities. And this is sort of the state of the tsunami propagation. And, and you see that approximately uh, 45 minutes after the, after the earthquake, we were able to produce a uh, source from the earthquake inversion uh, a, a tsunami source from the earthquake inversion to, for example, predict the arrival time and magnitude in Hilo or along the west coast, which was uh, actually done or completed after after four four hours and fifty minutes or so, when we had uh, when we could also include the signals at the dark stations. What is important for this? We could uh, we we had very good uh, inversion control because we could use the uh, the signals at the dart stations as well as the earthquake sources, uh, earthquake information, and that gives us a high confidence in the uh, in the robustness and liability of the results. The problem now is that what is what about hazard assessment and forecast for landslide generated tsunami, which is, seems much more difficult. And the goal is for me at least, to make things as, e as simple as possible, but not simpler, which means that I'm, I would like to find a, a way to approach uh, landslide-generated generated tsunamis in the way that <coughs> makes physical sense, but is also simple and, and reproducible by other people. <laughs> and for doing that, I will look at, first, the, the methods in the test case that I've studied. I will tell you a little bit about the numerical model, and then, obviously, the results. So what we do in this particular modeling effort, so this is a, a topography, a submarine topography, then uh, the landslide runout uh, masses can be mapped with, mapped with, uh, with uh, uh, multi-beam or seismic uh, measurements. We can determine the volume, and then we can, pr and then we can uh, sort of recreate, so we know the volume, this is the, uh, the current uh, topography, and we can sort of match in the the uh, initial position of the landslide the body before the modeling. And then what we do essentially, we, we uh, assign a certain viscosity to the landslide for simplicity, obviously. Uh, very, it would be very foolish to, uh, to uh, uh, argue that the viscosity is the best parameter to use for this. But just for demonstrating the, uh, uh, that this method may, might work, we choose viscosity. Give it, a, give it this landslide uh, uh, body, uh, then simulate the landslide, look at the waves on, uh, on the surface, and then compare the runout masses with these measured ones. Obviously, if the landslide masses ex uh, ex uh, exceed, let's say, the slide body, and are still, uh, have still reasonable velocity, obviously, the, the viscosity was too low. If the landslide does not move, stays where it is after triggering, uh, the viscosity was too high, so we sort of use an iterative process, a process to uh, uh, to match these these uh, the geometry of the landslide uh, uh, runout mass. I mean the measured one. So we look at the uh, the location at the beginning and the end, and sort of like the shape, and and we try to recreate that with our model. model. The uh, test case that I've considered is in uh, is in Chile. It's called the Valdez slide. It's about 200 kilometer off the Chilean coast. And here you see the outlines of the slide. What we just saw was the cross section between A and A and A uh, uh, dash uh, bar. And we s and an interesting fact is that it's on a trench. So which means like if we have a 
lens acceleration in this direction, it will, uh, the waves will move towards the Chilean coast instead of uh, away from it. So again, this is the, uh, this is what we, uh, this is the situation. The, uh, the Chilean uh, 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 coast is in this direction, and we look at waves that uh, were moving this direction away from the Chilean coast, but also towards the Chilean coast. The numerical model we use is called ICL, and uh, ITSEL stands for Simplified Arbitrary Lagrangian and Eulerian, and there are two different models of that. One is 2D and one is 3D version. Uh, we mostly use, uh, for this study, the, the 2D version, but now we are ready to go also 3D. And usually the code is, has been developed for meteorite impacts, and, and I've done some work uh, to include landslides as well. The code very uh, solves the compressor Navier Stokes equation. We have, at least in the 2D version, we have Cartesian and cylindrical coordinates. There are several uh, uh, constitutive and strength model models. Probably the best feature so far is the tracking of internal cell interface, which means we can have more than one uh, material in one grid cell. That gives us an, a, um, a very good uh, resolution, vertical resolution, for example, for the free water surface or the material. Uh, uh, between, for example, the slope and the, and the slide body. It's paralyzed, so it, it runs reasonably fast. It is extensively validated for, for impacts with experiments. There was a group, uh, a community effort to do that, so looking at simple impacts of uh, aluminum spheres and then compared to different models and it worked really well. The main, the main developer was Jay Mellorsch and, and Kai Wunderman and Gareth Collins and, and PhD students uh, uh, co uh, contributed and a little bit of me for the for the landslide cases. The, uh, <clears throat> the the features are so for impact in this case you have a, you have obviously a Eulerian and Lagrangian description, and so this will this will be the surface and this will be the projectile. And if you sort of uh, in the Eulerian case you have a very very blurry uh, you develop very blurry uh, interfaces between, for example, air and and mass because of the uh, sort of diffusive effect, diffusive effects. If you have a Lagrangian description, you deform the cells, obviously, but then you can have, because the deformations might be, or the deformation rates might be very large, and then you get like spurious uh, sort of sail geometries that are no longer um, sort of uh, uh, reliable for our case. What we did, we introduced the, uh, uh, the internal, internal uh, uh, interface tracking, Let's say we have a, an, a volume of, 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 of V and we have a fraction of a, of a volume of, uh, of V mat, and V mat is a certain material. And in this, in this case, if this, if this is distributed, we can then find the, uh, uh, find the uh, uh, internal boundary by looking at the concentration uh, in this boundary of material, and then recreate by looking at also the, the velocity, the, vectors at the nodes, at the, at the nodes uh, how the material should be distributed in this, in, this, uh, in this cell. So we have about, if I remember correctly, about 270 different configurations for how the, how the uh, um, internal cell boundary should, uh, should go. So with this, uh, with this method, we can have very few cells in the water column, and yet still that resolves the water surface to measure the waves uh, in, in reasonable um, uh, accuracy. And if you apply this kind of thing, uh, so it's Eulerian, if you will, but with this interface tracking, then we can see that we can actually really nicely see the, uh, uh, the free surface, in this case, of, obviously, of a meteorite impact. Why do we have uh, confidence in this model? There was, in 1958, there was a big uh, landslide in Alaska. It's called the Latuya Bay uh, landslide and tsunami. And uh, a colleague of, of mine, Herman Fritz, did his PhD thesis on that at ETH. And he sort of recreated this in the laboratory in a 1 to 625 scale model. And uh, there a lot of experiments. And we, we modeled this setting in the laboratory scale, so scaled down, but also in the prototype scale, so in the ge with the realistic geophysical uh, dimensions. And in these, in these snapshots here, you see uh, the different, different times, uh, the, uh, the situation. For example, here we start with obviously zero, and we have uh, uh, the lens that hasn't reached the, uh, 
the water yet, and as we go, the land that enters the water creates this huge wave, and then also runs up and down. And on the bottom here, you see in with the dashed line is the model from Herman Fritz, and the red line, I mean the physical model, meaning a laborat a laboratory experiments. And in the red line, you see our model, and in phase as well as magnitude or amplitude, uh, we are very uh, we get good results, good match. That means we have sort of a, a high level of uh, of confidence in our results. So now we go back to the Valdez slide to a, a less energetic uh, environment. Again, it's about 200 meter, 200 kilometers from the coast, and we simulate the uh, uh, the landslide runout masses based on the original, uh, based on the original uh, slide body location, or at least the projected one, with different uh, viscosities. We will measure the wave elevation on two different uh, 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 positions. One is at the toe of the original slide body, and one is at the other side. And just to, just to illustrate the, uh, the method I plotted in this way, uh, here is a, the slide body location for a viscosity that is much too large, so the slide didn't move much. And after 300 seconds, the slide still uh, remains at this spot. And it will remain here. I just, uh, I just uh, uh, stopped the, uh, the uh, um, simulation. Then in this case, the slide body has a too, uh, too little um, uh, viscosity and obviously exceeds the location of the, of the runout masses, the measured runout masses, and still has a velocity of about, I think it was 10 or so meters per second. So we're still going, that's obviously too low. Uh, for this case, we obviously have to low, lower the velocity. For, for the second case, where the viscosity is too, too small, we have to increase the viscosity to match these runout masses. And then essentially, we, uh, in an iterative uh, process, we find the optimal viscosity. And you can see that it not only sort of uh, stops reasonably well at the, at the location of the runout masses, it also has some sort of the shape uh, that we can find in the runout masses. So that gives us uh, the impression that we did something right in our modeling. Uh, this plot shows the number of iterations on X and then the log of the, uh, of the initial uh, viscosity of the slide and just having a range of, of, of these uh, viscosities. So from 10 to the minus, or 10 to, uh, so this is uh, 10 to the power of minus zero and this is 10 to the power of 20, which is rather viscous. Uh, we can arbitrarily distribute that. So this is a random pick. And then we carry out the modeling, and we can see that we always, for the same runout mass, we always end up at the same optimal viscosity. In this, in this case, it was, uh, if I remember correctly, 7.5 times uh, 10 to the power of 5. So for the same geometry, we get the same optimal viscosity that met, uh, for which the uh, similar uh, slide body matches well the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, measured one. And here is uh, the respective time series. This is S1, which is in, uh, in the back of the slide, so on the, on the opposite slide, away from the Euclidean coast. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the time series uh, at the toe of the, of the projected slide uh, uh, body at, t at time T0. And we see there's about a 50% a 50 or 100% increase from the, uh, from the uh, um, uh, optimal viscosity here, here with the solid line, and the uh, and the viscosity and the, and the time series with the uh, viscosity that is too low uh, for the dashed line. We also see that for the dashed line, we have a we have a huge drop here, and then essentially the wave behavior is, is quite different, I must say, and which has influence on the on the results in the end. Uh, just a little bit, uh, and this is uh, the second to last slide. Uh, we will look at the uh, uh, near field and far field evolution, just very simply, this uh, needs to be done in, in more comprehensive numerical models. Let's say that the water elevation for, for a mu that is too, too small is eta minus, and the one that is uh, optimal with mu, with the viscosity, with the optimal viscosity, then we say uh, nu naught. And we can compute the difference between the two as a function of, of the distance from the landslide source. Uh, and this general uh, attenuation uh, ratio we can we can use and we say Q here is between uh, a half and one and a half is the uh, is just geometrical spreading and one includes some dispersive effects. 
Then to bring, uh, to bring the eta as a function also of water depth, we can use Green's law. Uh, that, is, that looks simply like that. And as a side note, uh, actually many people used it before 1991, this law, but originally it's only derived for periodic waves. And our friend and colleagues in Alakis, uh, Cosas in Alakis derived it actually also for long waves <coughs> or solitary waves, and it came out to be exactly the same, which was sort of intuitive, but he actually uh, found the mathematical proof for that. If you do a plot of this, so R is the, uh, R is the, diff R is the uh, distance to the slat location. H tilde here is the, uh, is the error between, or the difference between the two. And we see that for an R of uh, to, uh, Q to the power of 1, and this is to the power of Q equals 1 half. And we see quite a difference. So there's about almost an order of magnitude difference between the two. If we use actually the, uh, the topography of the Chilean sort of the Chilean uh, uh, bathymetry from the slide to the coast, we see that it goes down quite a bit to about one, and then it, it increases again to about uh, three or four. And that's the arrow. That is not the, uh, <clears throat> not the wave arriving. That's the arrow between, uh, between the two uh, viscosities using the same approximation, sort of what, uh, what um, Stefan just presented on, on using the uh, the uh, uh, a dispersive and non-dispersive model for the uh, propagation in the Indian Ocean. And this is the, this is the end. Uh, we hope we make things as simple as possible, but not simpler with our results. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. If I remember correctly, we have four or five different models for strength and, and so forth in there. Uh, the problem is that they all need more than one parameter to play with, and that sort of uh, opens a parameter space that's very difficult to handle, given the fact that each of these models run for two weeks. Right. So uh, that's 2D. That's 2D. Uh, what do you mean? No, no, no. It's 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 x it, it's uh, x z. So it's not it's not not that any credit this. Right, but I mean, it, it's not three dimensional. Right, exactly. Yeah, right. It's a, so it's a cross section. Then the next question is on, on that MPK rate, which is um, the two factor. It's mm -hmm. also calculated with, with the two dimensional. Yes, that is just a longer. Uh, yeah, it's probably, uh, right. It's, it's just so too short. We just compare 2D and 3K for Kumbu and Yeka, and they're quite different. It uh, is. As if you go far away. And, and finally, the, the green slow is, is linear long wave theory, so it's one for non dispersive wave. Exactly, too. Yeah. Uh, that's another thing that could be improved as well. Right, I just, I just presented this last, last figure to see, just to give an, uh, some sort of an overview, what would be the consequences. So, obviously, we need to do the modeling of, of the wave propagation more carefully with numerical models and not just with linear. Uh, with linear uh, approximations, obviously. But, but just to give the difference, and I was, I was quite shocked uh, how large they are. And given, and given nonlinearity, we don't know if it's going to be higher or lower. That's the, right. that's the, that's the fun part of, of, of nonlinear the yeah. theory. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so listening to your talk and Stefan, your talk, uh, I have a question, you know, and sort of an idea of how to measure the uh, landslide volume. Uh, you know, you talked about measuring, looking at the bathymetry before and after the earthquake. But uh, we, I mean, this, we sort of look very carefully at some times. And uh, when you have a uh, non-landslide deposit sediment, it's usually layered. Because it's great, but then when you have a landslide, what happens is that it it starts like a uh, 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 cut, yeah, cut, but discontinually, and everything deposits, so it becomes very transparent. Sometimes, if you look very do a very high careful uh, high resolution, either 
size mate or acoustic measurement, you can sometimes distinguish the the <coughs> sediment that has deposited after the landslide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's actually that's how actually we, we computed this volume here. Is uh, people uh, had chip surveys and they did shallow yeah. seismic, and they could, and it's exactly true what you said. Uh, so you see the the uh, shelf sediments are very layered, and all of a sudden you have an area that has all sorts of chaos in it, and that is used to invert the the slide volume. Yes. But if I may comment, there are two main types of landslide. There is a debris flow that yeah, that's this uh, orientation. Simulated uh, what we considered for our case in Tohoku was more of a region rotational slide, similar to what is believed happened in Papua New Guinea in 1998. So it's a short displacement, more more or less rigid body motion. Uh, it doesn't go very far, but it can move a lot of sediment. To get the depths, you can also get it from a slope stability analysis, because uh, the seafloor uh, measurements only gives you the expression of the movement on the seafloor to get the depths then you need to estimate where the failure plane is if you don't have data. Now, if you have multiple data that can show you uh, the layers and, and, and you are able to pick up where the, the failure surface is, then you have a better uh, measurement of the volume. Um, okay. One last question before we take a short uh, coffee break. Just a question about the uh, dog. Uh, basically, uh, if, uh, if we observe the uh, amplitude of the difference between modeling and observation, uh, we can suppose that there is a, a, a landslide uh, caused by the, by the earthquake itself, and uh, so we can imagine that the difference is, is linked not at a, an error or to the source, but at the presence of landscape. Well, uh, that is a far-fetched, I guess. Uh, I think you could do that if you had complete con complete trust in your numerical model and, and your source. But other than that, I don't think, because of landslides behave so nonlinear and depend so much on the volume, on the material, how much uh, water is entrained during the landslide motion, what kind of motion it is, that it's almost impossible to, I, I, would, I would not do that because I would feel really uncomfortable with all the uncertainties that you that you uh, add to the to your modeling that has already uncertainty. But for example, if you, you observe a specific uh, bathymetry, and you can you can imagine that uh, landscape landslide can happen in some specific place. You can maybe uh, localize it and try to explain some of this observation and and decide if it's linked to this or not. Is it possible to use your modeling, for example? Or? Well, one would have to make laboratory experiments for seeing that in a laboratory state where we have full control over the entire uh, essentially a wave frequency spectrum that you that you enter. What we did though is uh, we looked at swell versus tsunami, so short waves versus tsunami waves and that actually uh, uh, we were able to, uh, well even within the, even with the swell and the tsunami we, we were able to sort of backtrace the tsunami so maybe that answers your question. It's just a, you know, an experiment that you have to perform uh, to get data and to validate your numerical model with them. Okay, but since uh, we'll have a short 10-minute uh, uh, coffee break, and we'll come back at uh, 11.30. Okay.